Hello. It's great to be here. I'm uh, very excited about uh, having a conversation with you guys about the topic of today and really power to you being here at 7 p.m. I really appreciate that and I feel very responsible for keeping you entertained because you're being here at a time that you could be anywhere else and having fun. So I will try my best to make it as fun as possible. Uh, so I'm a psychiatrist uh, and I'm an academic psychiatrist, uh, teach at the university and also do research. So before we get there, I have to say that I don't have any conflict of interest. Neither does Jasper, the most famous dog in Ann Arbor where I come from. Uh, so basically I run this lab, uh, Stress, Trauma and Anxiety Research uh, Clinic at uh, Wayne State University, which is uh, basically a clinic which work is focused on treating all sorts of anxiety, people with traumatic experiences, but we also do a lot of research. We do research, as it was mentioned earlier by Kristen, we look at the impact of exposure to war trauma, torture experiences, I work with first responders, cops and firefighters who are exposed to a lot of traumatic experiences, especially talking about guns today. Let's say cops and firefighters are among those who, before everyone else, are running towards where the shooting is, right? Or where they're, they're, a lot of times they face, uh, they are in this uh, incidence of shooting, they're, uh, they're facing uh, danger, so they're exposed to a lot of traumatic experiences. We look at the biology of the trauma, what happens in the brain when per people are traumatized and impacted by traumatic experiences. And then we work in advancing our ways of treatment. How can we make our treatments more effective and more helpful to people? If you want to know more about what we do, you can look at the uh, uh, website address below, which is the website to our lab. As Krista mentioned, another thing that has happened in my life has become uh, like involvement in uh, public education via media because well I do at some point in my life I realized that well we can I do a lot of work on a research proposal I get the funding I do the research I'm writing a paper and going through some multiple revisions after five years the paper is published and maybe 200 people read the paper but when we talk about some public issues related to mental health for the public let's say when the CNN does a report on our work, it's exposed to millions of people. So I thought it's very important and impactful to bring awareness to the public uh, uh, about mental health and social issues uh, linked to the mental uh, illness. So I have to make a few disclosures in the beginning. As I mentioned, I'm a doctor, I'm a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor who is specialized in disorders of brain and uh, treats people who have what we call mental illness, which I will discuss about a little bit later. I'm not a policy maker, so I don't know much about the politics. I, don't know much, I will not be discussing the politics of guns and what are the policies at the federal or state level about guns, about mental illness and about mental illness and guns. <clears throat> and of course, I'm not a gun expert. I've been to the range a few times, I've shot different types of guns, but that's all my exposure to guns, so I'm not an expert in that area. But I know mental illness, and today I will be talking about mental illness and how it's, its involvement, uh, and about the complexities of its involvement in when we talk about guns and gun violence. So, mass shootings have become part of the American life, like very often, like it's now in kind of very sad norm of the life that we hear on the news that there was someone grabbed a gun and killed a lot of people and every time there's a new place that we know we are, we are not always 100% safe anymore. It's movie theaters, it's schools, it's churches, it's, it could, it's mosques, it could be anywhere. So, and then when this, and, and it's not shocking to us anymore because it has become the normal, a new norm to have that unfortunately happen and people are kind of desensitized to this uh, experience. And anytime there's a mass shooting, well, there are a lot of discussions about, and mass shootings are in the eyes because media and news and everybody's paying attention and then there are a lot of discussions from all different areas of politics about, well, how should we deal with this? People talk about guns, people talk about background checks, people talk about different aspects of the story. And one of the things that always comes up 
is mental illness. Is that, well, we should do more, we should, the problem is mental health and the problem is mental illness and that's where we should go after. And then nothing happens. So, and as I mentioned, we usually hear about mass shootings because those are newsworthy. Those are what the media goes after. Not that those are not sad and tragic, of course they are, but there is a fact and reality that this is the number of people who die every year in America by guns. That's huge. And we don't hear much about the, that's like one, two, three people incidents of dying in the, uh, in the shootings because those are like, those are happening every day and those are not news worthy and not the news media are excited about them. And one fear, uh, and, and only one third of this number of deaths by guns are caused by homicide. So the two thirds is people taking their own life using a gun. And that's something that we rarely talk about, right? And I forgot to say in the beginning, because this is not a huge group, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to pause me if you have a question. Don't wait until the end, because you may forget the question. Uh, so feel free to stop me and ask your questions. And uh, once when I was shy about asking questions, one of my mentors told me the only stupid question is the question not asked. So go ahead and ask your questions. So, before we talk about mental illness and guns, we have to know what a mental illness is, right? So, what is a mental illness? Basically, it's a behavioral psychological syn syndrome or pattern of behavior. What do you mean by syndrome? By syndrome, we mean, that, that we mean that when we want to make a diagnosis, we look at the constellation of symptoms. It's a group of symptoms that we pile together and see, say, well, if out of these nine symptoms, a person had five of them at least, that for, for this duration of time and at this se severity, that person, let's say, for instance, has major depressive disorder. So we compile a group of symptoms to say what would be the condition or to cause it a mental illness. There's an underlying neurobiological or psychological reason for it. So we know what is happening in the brain. What are the differences in the brain of this person with this condition? compared to those people who do not have this condition, or there's a psychological reason. Let's say there's a very stressful relationship going on in their life. And then there's a clinically significant distress. The person is really distressed by what is happening to them, or dysfunction. So they cannot function at the job, they cannot function interpersonally, they cannot function socially. Let's say a person is, has, is social phobic as fear of social context and situations because they're worried that they may be judged by others. And of course, their social function is, is impaired. If, they, if they're here and they have a question, they will be too shy to ask it, right? Uh, and then it could be academic. So a lot of times mental, mental disorders limit the person's ability to function academically because if you're extremely anxious and nervous, your concentration is impaired. Your mind is somewhere else. Your mind is worrying about tomorrow or what happened last night or what is going to happen between you and your friend or whatever all the time. So it's hard to be while you're sitting here focused and listen to what, the, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. And then this is not something that is like a cultural or religious. A lot of times for one culture or one religion, what the other culture or religion does looks weird, but that's not a mental illness because this is something that we learn from our group. We learn about this is a normal behavior that we function and use it in, in the group setting. And this is a definition that the American Psychiatric Association has provided for mental illness. So a person should have all of these to be called mentally. And there's a lot of them. Just guess in that handbook that I mentioned earlier, the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic Manual, how many mental illnesses? Just throw in some, ran some random numbers. 5,200. <laughs> 5, what else? Any other numbers? 77. 77. Say it again. 500. <laughs> we'll see. You think there are 7,000 different conditions that I know? As a doctor, I should be a genius. <laughs> Say again. Yes. 
Uh, I'm still thinking about it. And this is the answer. You guys have high expectations. I thought I would surprise you. I would impress you by this 200 number. Uh, but there's a lot of them. Like, and what we are talk, talking about different diagnoses, right? This person has this diagnosis, this person has that. If they come to my clinic, I put that diagnosis when I want to build their insurance. So I say this is a diagnosis for this person. And I'm, I'm going to just talk about a few common categories. One is mood disorders. When the disorder or problem is in the mood, depression is very common. It's a very common condition. And it has all different forms of it from some levels of depression, from always being extremely and severely depressed with this, uh, this uh, dysfunction and the inability to be happy. I've had people who have for years never been unhappy, never been not unhappy. Like I asked them, when was the last time you were not depressed for a couple of months? They say, well, probably 10 years ago. And it's a very debilitating condition. Then we have the Bipolar disorder that most of you might have heard about, which is a condition, actually people with bipolar disorder also most of the time their problem is depression, but sometimes they have the extreme opposite of depression, not in a good way. Meaning that they, are, they have a lot of energy, they are grandiose, they have too many reckless thoughts, they are racing thoughts, they are on top of the world, they think they can solve all the problems in the universe, they do not sleep, they do reckless behavior, they use drugs, and then they can, they can ruin their life. Just imagine every person, just imagine right now I start having a manic episode with all the symptoms I told you. All my scientific reputation is gone in one day, right? And these conditions oscillate, come and go. It's not like a person who's bipolar is always manic. They may be manic once every three years for just one or two weeks. And the anxiety disorders, very common. And the field that I work in, so I'll be talking more about it because I love it. So you might have heard of panic disorder, a condition that all of a sudden, out of the blue, you start feeling extremely anxious, nervous, your heart is pounding. Uh, it's hard to breathe. You feel dizzy, your fingers go numb. A condition that lasts for a few minutes and is terrible, it feels like you're dying. So imagine you have this condition and you want to come to this talk. Well, one of your fears is that what if I have that experience in the, in the group? How am I going to get out of here? Which leads to social isolation and difficulty being in conditions that you can get out uh, easily. Phobias, all different kinds of fears of things, from fears of cats to dogs to tarantulas. Actually, the augmented reality that we talked about is a technology we're using to treat a, to, a fear of spiders and fear of snakes. I was giving a talk in Chicago and someone said, I have a clinic in Austin. We have a lot of people with fear of spiders and snakes, and we have a lot of them here, so it impairs people's lives. That was interesting knowledge for me. And then there's so if, social phobia. If I, yes, sir. So as far as being, you know, virtual reality, our brain, can, it's hard to comprehend reality and fiction, and that's one, one reason that that's a lot of the disorders are happening, right? I mean, I'm not a doctor, you're the doctor, but I'm just saying. Exactly, it's the animal brain. It's the animal brain, and the animal brain cannot differentiate much between the virtual spider and the real spider. And that's why it helps, we can use a virtual spider in treating people. How do you see that, like, you know, I know I guess they're trying to use that, how do you see that actually being used, you know, as a more of a tool, or is it gonna be more effective, because they're doing video games and all kinds of other stuff. I would love to talk to you about it, but after this, if you don't mind, because I wanna get to the guns. But I will talk to you after this, and I can show you some pictures, some cool pictures. Uh, so if I were social phobic, I could not be able, I, I would not, even if I know a lot of things, I would not be able to come here and talk to you guys, because I, was, I would be terrified to give a talk. And so I wouldn't be able to use all my potential. People who are general, uh, always anxious and worry about something, and then trauma-related conditions. Post-traumatic stress disorder, you might have heard about it. We'll talk about it more, because when there is a danger, when there's guns, when there's shooting, PTSD is a condition that's often happening. Substance use disorder, all different kinds of drugs, it's important. There's an asterisk there because a big chunk of violence in mentally ill is because of substance use. So if I have schizophrenia, severely impaired, and I'm not using drugs, my chance of being violent is much lower than when I'm using drugs. So when it comes to mental illness, actually substance use is one of the most important components and aspects. 
psychotic conditions, schizophrenia, delusional disorder, these are conditions that people's reality testing may be impaired. You hear things or see things that other people don't see. You have false beliefs, like I may be here and think that you guys are all after me and you're here to get me or kill me. So if I have that kind of delusion, that will be, life is a scary condition. Or I think that people are plotting something against me. I think aliens are here, like I can hear all the voices and they're controlling my mind. So, and we have treatments for all these conditions. And then there's personality disorders, which is basically a person's way of carrying themselves and dealing with themselves and the world is different. And one of them which is com I will talk about is uh, antisocial personality disorder, which is like all the psychopath and uh, the psychopathy that's a personality disorder. So there's a lot, right? Now I have, uh, let's see how common these conditions are. Why is that important? Because if only 0.02% of the general population had a severe mental illness, well, it would be much easier to talk about it when it comes to guns. Otherwise, it would be a different story, right? So let's see. What percent of Americans do you think have clinical depression? And when we talk clinical, it means that so from zero, no depression at all, to 100% depression, basically the way we diagnose clinical depression, we draw a line at let's say 70 and say whoever is above is clinical depression and whoever is below is not. So it doesn't mean that who, people who are not on this list don't have any symptoms. Give me a random number. Six percent. One in five Americans. One in five Americans. One in three. One in three. Let's see. Someone was right. Yes, one in five Americans at some point in their life experienced some level of, uh, well, experienced major depression. Anxiety? One in five. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. People who are exposed to extreme traumatic experiences and have flashbacks and nightmares and cannot be out there and like cannot sleep, always are ready to be startled. A percent of the Americans. In veterans and first responders, as high as 30 percent. Psychosis, schizophrenia. One in a hundred people, Americans, experience schizophrenia. Bipolar disorder, one percent. So what does this mean? This means that a large number of us, at some point in our life, have a mental illness. So when we talk, when, we, when, we, when there's a gun violence and we say, well, we should act, limit access of people mentally ill to guns, this is what we're talking about. How are you going to do that? Right? So, let's see how much time we have. This is Dobby, actually. Uh, so when can a mental illness be dangerous? Actually, majority of the times that the person is dangerous and a psychiatrist like me decides that they have to go in the hospital, it's not because I'm worried that they're going to kill someone. I'm worried that they're going to kill themselves or they're not capable of, they're too psychotic and disorganized to be able to take care of their basic needs. If I, if, if, well, we don't have the privilege of warm weather here in Michigan, so if in the winter I leave them on their own, they will, be, they will die on the street out of, uh, in the cold because they are not even capable of going to a shelter. So majority of the times when we are talking about the danger in mental illness, we are talking the danger of self-harm, a person harming themselves and killing themselves. And if we go, when it also comes to the guns, that is a major condition. Because if I have a patient who is dealing with severe depression and is suicidal, and I know they have access to firearm, that's a nightmare for me. Risk of harm to others is very low, despite the myth that we have heard about, like mental illness being dangerous to others. It is slightly, especially when it comes to severe mental illness, it's slightly higher. It's slightly higher, and I have the numbers here because it's hard for me to memorize those numbers. So let's say in people who, and we are not talking about guns, we are talking about violent behavior in general, all kind of violent behavior. If it is like 0.8%, like less than one in a hundred people, in people who don't have a mental illness, it's 1.7%. Like 
in people who have a psychiatric illness. So it's less than 2%. So it's not like if it is less than 1% in others, it's like 70% in people who have a mental illness. And then when it comes, the thing is that when it comes to substance use, it goes very high. So it goes from 3% to people without a mental, con uh, without other, just, just those who use substance, use drugs, 3% goes to 10%. And we're not talking about gun violence, we're talking about violence in general, because it would be terrible if 10% were using guns to kill others. As I mentioned, substance use increases the risks. And then there are personality disorders, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, actually, those are people who are, you have seen them in the movies, criminals, they don't have uh, some of the criminals in the movies that you, you see now. All of them. They don't have experience, they cannot experience guilt. They are very selfish. It's all about them. They're reckless, they're impulsive, they use drugs. They're violent towards humans and animals. They don't have any feeling of remorse. They're manipulative. They take advantage of other people. And I have news for you. Most of these people don't come to my clinic and say, hey, I'm a bad person. I'm, I, like, I don't have the ability to experience shame. Come fix me. No, we don't see most of these people. When, you, when, they, do, when they do act criminally, they mostly end up in the prison and in the uh, uh, criminal system. I don't see a lot of them. And a lot of use of weapons, especially in crime, is, uh, is uh, by these people. So, and if I have a patient that I see, uh, that I determine as a psychiatrist, that they have a risk of harming others or themselves, we don't let them just go home. We find a way to convince them to go into the hospital, and if they are not, then there's involuntary admission to the hospital, short term or for too long term. There are people who are considered chronically dangerous to others and because of their mental illness and they're in a forensic state hospital for a long time, month, or years, right? But if I don't see them, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of people with psychiatric, severe psychiatric illness who are out there that I do not see, they don't seek help. Actually, there's data that at, in all different areas, 50% of people with mental illness all kinds, from a simple phobia or anxiety to severe uh, schizophrenia. Do not seek psych uh, tra treatment, do not get help. So if I'm not seeing them, so when you say, well, we should, we should limit access of people with mental illness or severe mental illness or dangerous mental illness to guns, well, if I don't see them, if they are not under my care, if they are, if they are, not, they are under the radar, then how are we going to do this? Uh, I'm sorry, I just keep forgetting I have this in my hand and move back to the computer. So let's look at the data. Majority of people, even with severe mental illness, and this is a myth that the, because media, movies, rumors, any anything, anything that can be exciting, they use it, right? And in the movies, especially older movies, people with mental illness are dangerous. And so now, and we, when we talk about psychosis, like we, we just, just did talk about depression. One in five, anxiety, one in five. And actually, some data shows one in three people have experienced some sort of anxiety disorder. And when it comes to psycho psychosis, it's just like a, that's the one to three percent. So, and psychotic patients, most of the times. So before I went to the psychiatric hospital to start my residency, a lot of people were like, oh, aren't you afraid? Well, then when I went there, majority are extremely vulnerable because a person with schizophrenia, severe schizophrenia, doesn't have a lot of support, is not able to navigate their environment. They are uh, like, if you're constantly hearing voices like judging you, it's not like easy to be able to function well. Their cognitive function is impaired, they, are, uh, they don't have social skills, a lot of times they have what we call negative symptoms, which is basically inability to socially function and have cognitive um, ability. So basically imagine a person like this, well they don't have jobs, they don't have support, so probably a lot of homeless people on the streets deal with psychosis or schizophrenia. Who's more vulnerable? to abuse and trauma and beating and rape than that person on the streets. So a lot of times when it comes to severe mental illness, rather than feeling scared, I as, as a person who has dealt with it for a long time, I'm worried about them. 
A lot of times we are saying, well, if we let this guy go, he can't protect himself on the streets. He can't survive. Uh, when there's a risk, again, as I mentioned, there's self-harm. I think if I'm not wrong, about 50, about half of uh, uh, the uh, uh, suicide by guns are uh, contributed by people who have me mental illness or severe mental illness. So when they use a gun, they use a gun to kill themselves most of the times. It happens in severe depression, it may happen in PTSD, it may happen psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder. So when we are worried, most of the times when I'm worried about access to firearms and mentally ill, is that I'm worried that they may kill themselves. So this, that's, that's three to four percent. So this isn't what we call attributed risk, attributable risk. What does that mean? That means that if I had a magic wand and today I just removed mental illness, severe mental illness from all those people who have it, who may act violently, we will only remove four percent of the violence that is happening. So 96% of the violence in the society, let this, let this sink in, 96% doesn't have anything to do with mental illness. And then as I mentioned, if we can limit substance use among mentally ill, the risk of uh, harm to others or self is going to subside. So this is one other fact. Basically mental illness especially severe mental illnesses. So there's a lot of studies of prevalence, right, across the world. We talked about the data in America, but the prevalence is almost the same across the world. So anywhere else, any other country, all those other countries that don't have a lot of mass shooting or don't have any mass shooting, they have the same prevalence of severe mental illness relatively in their countries. So when we talk about mental illness and guns, it's more of an access issue than the mental illness itself being a condition that leads to people killing a lot of people. I a lot of times use this uh, example uh, when I'm talking about causality and because I feel it's not going to insult anyone because I myself have this condition. Forty percent of men have male pattern baldness. Understandably so, percentage of car accidents will involve people, male, males who are bald, right? Do you know which movie this is? Come on. Of course. Two famous handsome bald men, right? <laughs> this doesn't mean that baldness causes car accidents. If a percentage of, let's say, if a percentage of women have longer hair, it's understandable that a percentage of women who buy milk have long hair, right? If a percentage of a people, if a, that huge percentage of people, general population, have a mental illness, what's well, understandable, coincidentally, a person with depression may kill people or himself. Doesn't mean that the mental illness was the cause. The same way here, baldness was not the cause of the car accident. A bald person was in a car accident because, well, people have car accidents and, and a percentage of people have male pattern baldness, so that's understandable. So just the fact that a person with depression or psychiatric diagnosis or anxiety may kill someone, it doesn't mean that the mental illness condition was the cause of that thing. When we talk about causality, actually, when it comes to the field of forensic psychiatry, it's a very complicated situation. Like, there are even, like, like Let's say someone, uh, someone uh, the, did a murder and they have a psychotic disorder. They have to, to be known that to, to get the chance of uh, being uh, like not have, being responsible because of insanity. They, we, the, it should be proven by their attorneys and the doctors that at the moment that they did the act of violence, they were psychotic. Because psych psychiatric illness has oscillations, the symptoms come up and down. So it's just the fact that I have a label of diagnosis doesn't mean that everything I do is because I may be anxious, an anxious person. At the same time, I can be a jerk. 
So my jerkness, being a, not a nice person, doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with my anxiety a lot of times. So now let's talk about some of the complexities. So if we, let's say at some point we decided to take away guns from mentally ill who are dangerous. And they pose a risk of using a firearm to kill people. And they say, because a lot of times you hear, you may hear in the news, they're like, okay, so it's mental illness and guns. We should, we should take away the guns from them. And then there's a lot of politicians come out and talk about it to the TV and in the news. And then nothing happens. And one of the reasons nothing happens is that, number one, it was just a talk. There was like, there's a, they rarely come out and talk about these issues because every day people are getting killed on the streets. They come out when the media are poking at them because there was a mass shooting that everybody's paying attention. Yes? So, have you looked at mass shootings as Columbine and the increase of social media? Because, I mean, wouldn't there be a, a correlation? In terms of learning from others? Well, and yeah, and more of what people have talked about, the cop aspect of it behind it. I have not personally looked into it but I don't know what is the evidence. So a lot of times when it comes at least to suicide, what they call copycat, does not, it's not showing an increase of the prevalence because they are learning from others. They may learn some methods from others. But, but when we are talking about mental illness... So more it, or less the, the coverage. Because since Colin, my Colin was once one of the main ones that was covered. Yes, media, and, and that's the discussion that media coverage may give them like some excitement about doing this, especially most of these people are to totally isolated. And that's why a lot of times the media decide not to talk about their names, not to talk about them, mostly talk about the victims, not show a lot of pictures of the shooters to take away that, that component of like, okay, I'm gonna be a famous person. But when it comes to mental illness, when we wanna say, okay, we wanna limit person, people, these, uh, their access to firearms, number one. Which mental illness out of those 200 and some? What are we going to say should take away their guns? Should it be like, should we say psychotic people? Should we say depressed people? Should we say veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder? Or should we say who? So that's a big qu first question. Then the question is at what stage? So when a person is psychotic, let's say schizophrenic, when there are medications, a lot of times the symptoms are gone. And a lot of these illnesses are peri periodic. A person with depression at, a time, at times when depression is extremely severe may become psychotic and lose their reality testing. But that's a very short period of time in that person's life. So if one of those five Americans who have depression, if some of those people at some point become psychotic and lose reality testing, should we take the guns away from them or not? Are they allowed to buy guns or are they not allowed? Same applies to bipolar illness. I talked earlier, I said earlier to you guys that when a person has bipolar illness, at times they may become manic. I've had patients who have been manic, like they're 50 years old, they have only had two manic episodes in their whole life. Are they allowed to get guns or are they not allowed to get guns? So these are the complexities, right? Because people have to talk about when we say, okay, we want to take away, we want to restrict access of mentally ill to guns. Who are we talking about? Who should make the call? Is it me that says, okay, this patient of mine doesn't seem to have the ability to use a gun safely, so I have to take away the gun from them. Should it be a council of psychiatrists who will make the judgment? Should it be a forensic psychiatrist? Should it be a judge? That's another question which is not answered yet. How about those who are not seeking help? Actually, when you say, okay, this is one of the things that may happen to you if you go to, psychiatrist, to a psychiatrist. A lot of people may decide not to see a psychiatrist. A lot of people who have a gun, they're like, oh, if I see a psychiatrist, they may take away my gun. So that may actually limit access of some people or seeking, oh, I already said half of people who have mental illness are not getting care. Now imagine that there's like people who have guns in their house. And, and one other thing, issue is that when we talk about guns, it's not just my gun. A lot of people in their home have guns, right? Their dad has a gun, their uh, I don't know, spouse has a weapon. So what are we gonna do with that? 
And then if we want to say, okay, all people with mental illness or severe mental illness or this kind of mental illness, let's say we came up with a magical formula to say, well, this kind of people with mental illness, we have to take away guns or should not have access to guns. Uh, well, a just limited number of people come to my care. Should we have a psychiatric examination for everybody who wants to purchase a gun? Should, should, should psychiatric evaluation become part of the background check? Because we want to be fair to everybody. We don't want, we don't want to punish those who seek psychiatric care and treatment only, right? And then uh, mental illness can start at any time, point in time in life. A lot of times people who have a psychiatric condition and because of that act violently, Actually, that violent act is the first time their condition is di diagnosed. A lot of times they're just sitting in their homes and being psychotic and not dealing with a lot of people. When they come out and do something aggressive and violent, they end up in hospital. So a lot of times we don't know those. And these conditions can start at any time in your life. There are like, ab like some estimates of what are the most common times of a psychiatric condition happening in all of those areas. But a lot of times, like, like when speaking about schizophrenia, it can happen anywhere from like young adult age until like 50, 60 years old. So are we going to then have like, are we going to have like regular, like the same way when if you have to renew your license, so you have to do a vision check, right? Are we going to do that for people who have guns? Okay, every five years you should do a psychiatric evaluation because we want to make sure you're safe or every two years or every one year. And if you want to do any of this, who's going to pay for it? One of the big problems in, at this point in time, just billing insurances or getting the money or having funds for psychiatric care for those people who just want to get treatment is very difficult. A lot of people don't have access. I have seen a lot of people who have dealt with severe depression for more than a year because their insurance was not covering the treatment. And they come to me, I'm like, where were you all this time? Or even I've had patients that I was treating and then disappeared for two years and then they come back, I'm like, where have you been all this time? Suffering. They're like, well, my insurance changed and it wasn't covering treatment. So we don't even have money for that. I'm not trying to be pessimistic though. I just mentioned this earlier. Symptoms oscillate. If I, if I had an episode of major depression five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, how about now? So now let's talk about potential harms of using mental illness in politics in general. These are two papers by me, two articles by me, and these are from both sides of this story. One side is when you might have heard a group of psychiatrists came out and said, hey, the president has a psychiatric illness and we're gonna, we are diagnosing him and all that stuff. And I wrote this piece in the Washington, which was published in the Washington Post about how bad this thing is, how it's gonna hurt. Psychiatric business hurts me uh, mental illness, creates stigma and how it will reduce the trust. Well, half of this country is supporting the president. How would they feel about psychiatrists? How would they feel about, how would they feel about bringing their, their kid to a, uh, like these liberal psychiatrists who are making up all this stuff because they are for the political agenda. On the other hand, there was a time that, I don't know if you guys remember that short period, 10 days period of time of Scaramucci being in char charge of the White House, House uh, I think it was a PR, and one day came out that he used the word schizophrenia to insult someone else. And we wrote a piece about how bad it is when it happens both sides by the physicians or psychiatrists to use mental illness diagnosis as an insult. Schizophrenia affects 1% of this population. One in every hundred Americans are schizophrenic. How would they feel when they hear their, their diagnosis is used as an insult, as a curse word? <clears throat> so, okay, what are the potential harms? Stigma. For centuries, people with mental illness have been seen as subhuman, have been taken, their rights have been taken away from them, they, they were restricted. And as we are learning more and more about them knowing that, well, these are not demonic activities, these are like brain conditions. There are, these are brain conditions, changes, changes in the brain, anatomy and behavior and function and chemistry, leading to me feeling anxious or feeling depressed or hearing voices. And we have treatments for this like any other medical condition. Like the same way we would not stigmatize a person who has diabetes or high blood pressure now, 
Same applies to mental illness. But when we bring it up every time, there's something terrible happening, we link it to mental illness. How would people feel about it? And how would people, so people, other people knowing, my neighbors knowing, okay, so there's this guy that, who's seeing a psychiatrist in this neighborhood. How do we feel about hanging out with him? What if he kills our kids? And then the other way around. How do I feel about myself? I feel terrible. I feel worried. I hate my diagnosis. And that's one of the reasons a lot of times patients don't want to get diagnosed. They come, I see them and they're, and, and they're like, well, if I do the treatment, if I get treatment, it means that there's something terribly wrong with me. And I don't want to accept that because of all the stigma. Otherwise, if they have high blood pressure, they're work. And, and I use that example to tell them, hey, this is something like other conditions. And then, uh, same, as I mentioned, affects the way they seek in the treatment. I've had people who were, who were not, in, like, I, I remember I had this young woman who was being treated for depression, and she was going through a divorce proceeding. And she was terrified that her, like, the, her current husband can take that diagnosis to the court to take away the ch her children's custody. And I had to talk to her a lot and say, no, there is no way and there's no evidence that your judgment or ability to care for your kids is limited or impaired. And if needed, I will come to the court and fight for you. So these are the fears. If at some point there's laws about this, a lot of people may say, hey, I don't want to lose my gun. I don't want to lose my rights. I don't want to lose a lot of other things. I don't want to have a file in the judicial system, in the criminal system. And it affects the way, as I mentioned, if people look at them differently, then people will treat them differently and uh, the potentials for job, potentials for any other relationship or like dating for like, if you said I have depression, then people are like, oh, should we hang out with this person or not? Should we? And we have, we have talked about how prevalent all these conditions are. Like one in five people at some point in their life experiences some sort of severe mental illness. And then, as I mentioned, trust and comfort in sharing with me. Like if I have thoughts about self-harm or if they like, have some obsessions about, well, I hate so-and-so and I have a gun, but they don't want to kill someone, they don't want to talk to me. They won't, they won't, they won't be very comfortable sharing them with the, with the treating provider, with the psychiatrist who's treating them. 